The following program is transcribed. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. During the past few weeks, thousands of postcards have been mailed by Equitable Society representatives. Thousands of personal phone calls have been made urging people to pay particular attention to the commercial on this equitable program tonight. When you hear this message, you'll understand why. It tells about the Equitable Society's independent 60s plan, a practical, workable plan for men and women who want to be completely self-supporting when they reach the age of 60. I'll give full details in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Respectable Thief. The success of swindlers in this country and the fact that they collect millions of dollars every year from unsuspecting citizens is all the warning against them any alert person should need. There is no reason for the continuing success that swindlers enjoy, except for the fact that every year they find a new crop of people who are looking for a pot of gold at the end of a man-made rainbow. That most of their stories are engrossing is true. That most of them are extremely personable and charming people is also true. But those two things are not reasons for investing your money with a stranger. Rather, they should make you cautious Two major factors in the success of our nation's swindlers are the joint facts that no law enforcement agency can stop a swindler before he commits his crime. And that once he has done his work, it is frequently too late to recover the money he has stolen. For those reasons, it will pay you well to remember one cardinal rule. Investigate before you invest. Tonight's file opens in the private office of Walter Stevens, located in the downtown skyscraper of a large eastern city. Mr. Stevens' secretary has just ushered in a visitor, one Mr. Marshall. Sit down, Marshall. Okay. Yeah. Cigar? Never use it. Well, how about a drink? I've got some... Look, I... Mr. Stevens, you don't have to romance me like I'm a customer. Let's get down to business, huh? Very well. Who told you about me? Ned Hollinger. Oh. You, uh... You might be pleased to know that Ned thinks you're the best in the business. That's fine. So, on the strength of that praise, I called you. We'll write down this name and address. I'd rather just remember things. Oh? Well, what is it? Victor Brown, 215 North Adams Street. He's a man about 50 with gray hair. He, he wears glasses Mr. And... Stevens. Yes? Before we go any further, let's get the financial arrangements straightened out, huh? I figured on paying you 500. That's not enough. How about a thousand? What did Ned Hollinger tell you, Judge? A thousand. A man like you must know that the price of everything has gone up. All right, you name it. Two thousand. Well, that, that's pretty steep. That's the number, Mr. Stevens. Well, okay. It's a deal? Yes. Oh, one other thing. This must look like suicide. That'll cost you another five hundred. Now, wait a minute. Cherry on the cake, Mr. Stevens. All right. When do you want it done? Tonight. Ted. Yeah, honey? I hate to bother you with this right after dinner, but I'd like you to go over these bills with me. Huh? What bills? Oh, grocery, butcher, milkman. I just can't make it work anymore, honey. I'm just going to have to have a bigger allowance. Look, some other time with that, Jonah. I'm trying to think something out. Oh, I'm sorry. What's the trouble? I get a commission today. Who from? A guy named Walter Stevens. Uh-huh. He wants me to knock off an old gentleman named Victor Brown. I don't know. I can't figure it. Well, why not? 
Yes, Mr. Brown lives on Adams Street over a dirty saloon. Yeah? I went over, got a line on the guy. Well, what's he like? Yeah, he gets loaded every day, goes upstairs, sleeps it off, then he comes down to the saloon for more. The thing that's got me, though, is I can't figure why Stevens wants him taken care of. Well, maybe he knows something. It would have to be real important. Where does he get the money to drink all day? He had a job up to a couple of days ago. How'd you find that out? I talked to the old guy. What's his Stevens paying for the job? Twenty-five hundred. Well, that's pretty high. He isn't having the old man knocked off because he's a drunk. You can bet on that. Yeah, and you can bet on something else. If it's worth twenty-five hundred to Stevens to have him taken care of, it might be worth a lot more to us to find out why. When did you say you'd do the killing? Tonight. Any special time? No. Well, let's go over these bills first, then, huh? Meanwhile, at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching the desk of Agent Norman Grant. You busy, Norman? No, Jim. I just got to sign this report. Okay. There, that one's finished. Uh, don't lean back and relax, Norm. The boss just put you on a case I'm working on. Well, that was a short vacation. <laughs> What's this one about? Some Boy Scouts were out hiking on Sunday up in the hills. They ran across a body. Where? Just off Fire Trail 23 up in the National Park. They called the police. The police called us in. Well, how long had the body been there? Medical examiner said the man had been dead about a year. Mm, I don't imagine any identification was possible then. No, no physical ident. But near the body, which had been buried in a shallow grave, the scoutmaster found an address book. Could you still read anything in it? Yeah, it was pretty well preserved. Was the owner's name in the book? No. No, I sent it down to the lab. Had them smoke up all the pages so we could read the names and addresses. How'd the job come out? Fine. The lab did a great job on it. Well, then I called every person in the book. We had them list any friend who might have had their address or a friend they hadn't heard from in a year. The name Dodge turned up on a dozen of the lists. Well, then I checked back with every one of them and found out who the dead man was. Who was he? Well, do you remember the disappearance about a year ago of a man named Paul Dodge? Mm, no, not particularly, Jim. I was in the San Francisco office last year. Oh, that's right. I forgot that. Well, Paul Dodge was a bookkeeper who disappeared completely. Shortly thereafter, his employer, a man named Walter Jones, went through bankruptcy. Who was Jones? Oh, a promoter. He was engaged in promoting a new airport here in town at the time. And, of course, his bankruptcy cost a lot of local people their wartime savings. Well, if Dodge was buried up in the hills, wouldn't you say that it's certainly safe to assume that he was murdered, Jim? Yeah, no doubt about that. Well, where is this Walter Jones? He left town shortly after the bankruptcy. Norm, I think our job now is to see if we can find Jones. here, Ted? Uh-huh. There he is, back in the rear booth. Want me to wait at the bar? No, baby. Come on back with me. He's a nice old guy. I love talking to him. Hello, Mr. Brown. Oh, hello there, son. Uh, Mr. Brown, this is my wife. Oh, how, uh, how do you do? Hello. <laughs> do you mind if we sit down with you? Oh, no. No, no, please do. Well, thank you. Oh. What do you want to drink, honey? Rye and ginger. Okay. How about you, Mr. Brown? Straight bourbon. Huh? Two rye and ginger, one straight bourbon. Right, coming up. Why, oh, I'm very pleased that you were able to, well, to stop by here again. Well, I told the wife about it, and she wanted to see the place. You live in the neighborhood, do you? No, no. Oh, that's a pity. I was hoping I, well, I'd have the pleasure of, of your congenial company often. Oh, are you in here a lot, Mr. Brown? Well, I commute between here and my apartment upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your drinks. Oh, thanks. That's a buck eighty. All right. Hey, yeah, keep the change. Thanks. Mr. Brown, how can you spend so much time here? Are you in the banking business? Oh, would that I were, young lady. I guess a wife means that you live like one. Oh, I'm a man of many trades, but banking has never been one of them. My last employment was bookkeeping for an investment company. Oh? Which one, Mr. Brown? I worked for a man named Walter Stevens. He was organizing a stock issue for a television network. Uh -huh. Didn't you like it there? Oh, up to a point, I did. And then I... Oh, well, well I, I shan't burden you with my problem. Oh, no, no, no. Talk them out, Mr. Brown. It'll do you good. No, no. It's a private matter. Say, uh, let's have another drink. Okay, I'll call the bartender. Oh, no, no, never mind. I'll go up and get them. Mm -hmm. Charlie doesn't serve the tables when there's anybody at the bar. Pardon oh, me. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. Sure. Honey, I think I know what this is all about. You do? Yeah. Now, I'm not going to do anything to this old man until I have another talk with Stevens. 
You stay here with Mr. Brown. I'll be back later. Jim, here's a further report from the medical examiner on Paul Dodge. Oh? Two bullet holes through the head. Well, that clinches the murder theory. The police are digging around where the body was found to see if they can locate any bullets. Good. Might help if they can find some. Did you get anything on the man he worked for, this uh, Walter Jones? Well, yes and no. What do you mean? I discovered some things that make his bankruptcy seem awful suspicious, but I don't know where he is. Where did the trail lead to? Well, I started at the apartment hotel where he used to live. He moved out of there a few days after the bankruptcy. Did they have any forwarding address? No, but the transportation desk at the hotel fortunately keeps records. Oh. They told me that he bought a compartment on a train from Miami Beach when he left. Mm -hmm. They also told me what hotel he'd gone to, so I called our office down in Miami and had them checked. Well, did they come up with anything? I found out that Jones had spent an awful lot of money gambling when he was down there last year. Oh, sounds like it was a profitable bankruptcy. It certainly does. Then from Miami, Jones went to Philadelphia. Well, let's notify the Philadelphia office to locate and interview him. I did that. Jones can't be located. Oh. Say, we're due in Philly to be witnesses in the forest kidnapping case tomorrow morning. Yeah, I know. As soon as we're through in court, I think we'll do a little checking up. <laughs> Mr. Stevens. Huh? Doing a little work on the books. Well, how did it go? It didn't. What? Brown is still alive. What's the idea? The price has changed. What do you mean? I had a talk with the old guy. Look, we made a deal, Marshal. Yeah, that's right. I didn't know when we made it what your angle was. No, I do. You collected a lot of dough to start a television network. Are you going to skip with it and hang the shortage on old man Brown, huh? Marshal, even if that were true, it wouldn't be any of your business. It is when it affects the price. There's a new line in this race. I want 50% of the whole deal. Are you kidding? No. Look, look, forget about Brown. I'll get somebody else to do the job. Oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Well, what can you do about it? Call the cops. You think they'd believe someone like you with a record? Oh, I wouldn't tell them who I am. I just... Call him on the phone, give him a tip. That's all. Marshal. Yeah. How about 25%? Uh-uh. I want 50, and I want it in cash. Now I'll just make myself comfortable here till you okay the deal. <laughs> Still in the saloon? No. Where is he? Oh, he got very drunk and very unhappy. Had to take him upstairs to his apartment. Is he up there now? Yeah. Let's go up. Get your deal straightened out? Uh-huh. We go in here and up a flight of stairs. Mm. What's the old guy unhappy about? Because oh, he was a failure. Used to be a big man, he said. Oh. Didn't stop drinking. Became a bum. The bartender said he straightened himself out when he went to work for Stevens. And all of a sudden, he started drinking again. I think I know his reason. Why? Yeah, it's a long story. All I can tell you is he gets a dirty deal. Poor old guy. You gonna kill him now? Mm-hmm. That's his room there. Left his door unlocked. Okay, baby. Holy. Joan, come here. What is it? What's the matter? Oh. There's a bullet hole right through the old man's head. We will return in just a moment to tonight's file, which shows how your FBI helps promote national security. Now let's talk briefly about another kind of security. Security for men and women who want to look forward to independent 60s. Well, what's that mean? Financial independence after you're 60 years old? That's it exactly, Bruce. Independent 60s means that you've got a regular monthly income guaranteed for life. You're not asking help from anyone. So what you do is your own business. 
to you, Bruce, Independent 60s may mean a chance to catch up with all the fishing you've missed in your busy years. I can see you in your outboard motorboat with a look in your eyes that says you're going to get the biggest muskie in the lake. Or to another man, Independent 60s means a pleasant home in a friendly little town with a garden and a workshop and a place to pitch horseshoes. But no matter what your picture may be, why not do something about it right now? Take the first step towards a better future by investigating the Independent 60s plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society. I've heard those plans are pretty expensive, Mr. Keating. Guess I'd better wait a few more years before I start investigating. Well, if that's all that's holding you back, Bruce, then your Equitable Society representative has a very pleasant surprise for you. He'll work out an Independent 60s plan that's geared to your present income. Actually, if you're between the ages of 30 and 45 and covered by Social Security, you'll be amazed how little this Equitable plan costs, considering how much it does for you. At any rate, it costs absolutely nothing to find out. Your Equitable Society representative will give you the facts. Get in touch with him soon. Or write care of this station to the home office of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Now back to tonight's file, The Respectable Thief. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI once more brings home the truly callous emotions of the professional criminal, the man who attempts to make his living through pillage or arson or murder. He brings to his work many attributes, this man who must inevitably fail, but foremost among his characteristics there is an utter disregard for his fellow man. If the untimely death of one of those fellow men or more than one, will bring the criminal further surcease from labor, then that fellow man who stands in his way must die. He has no compunctions about it, no pangs of conscience. To him, it is perfectly obvious that only the strong deserve to live, and that those who are strong are at liberty to assert their strength in any manner they choose, even when that assertion of strength carries with it someone else's verdict of doom. Tonight's file continues in the shabby apartment of the late Victor Brown. Poor old man. He killed himself. Yeah. Did you uh, touch anything in his room when you brought him up? No, why? The poor and having any fingerprints found in here. Aren't you going to take the gun out of his hand? What for? It's supposed to make it look like a suicide, and I don't have to bother. Ted. What? How does this help Stephen? Wait. Well, Goes through bankruptcy and says the old guy stole all his money. Oh. Then he keeps the money. Yeah, not all of it. That's what I want to talk to him about. We get 50%. Yeah? What's that come to? About 50 G's. Honey, when do you get it? In the morning when I see Stevens. Come on, baby, let's get out of here. <laughs> Jim, we're free to work on the Jones case. Why? What happened? The Forrest kidnapping case has been continued until next Monday. That's good. Oh, I've been doing a little work on Jones this morning. Find anything? Yes, I had his picture with me, and I found a hotel clerk who recognized him. Unfortunately, he moved out six months ago. Where to? I don't know that yet, but the clerk did tell me two things. The first is Jones has changed his name. To what? Walter Stevens. The other is he saw Stevens here in Philadelphia yesterday. Where? Coming out of a restaurant down on Broad Street. Oh, did he remember what restaurant? Yes, I went over there, but apparently Stevens isn't a regular customer. They didn't know who he was. Well, at least we know he's here. Yeah. Oh, I asked the local police to check, see if they could find out where he lived or where his office was. And I looked in the phone book, and the only Walter Stevens that's listed isn't the one we want. Oh, I see. Oh, excuse me. Sure. Special Agent Taylor. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Sergeant Warren. Yes, hello, Sergeant. Your Mr. Stevens has an office in the Wright Building under the name of the Broadlawn Television Network Company. Right building, and that's the Broadlawn Television Network Company. Is that it? Yeah. Thanks very much, Sergeant. Not at all. Goodbye. Bye. We've got a lead on Stevens' home. Oh? Look, will you check here and see what you can find out about the uh, 
Broadlawn Television Network Company? Sure. I'll go up and see if I can have a talk with him. Hello? Hello, Mr. Stevens. That you, Marshal? Yeah. What do you want? Just call to tell you everything went okay last night. You took care of it? Sure. The old man give you much of a fight? Well, a little. You're a liar. What did you say? I got a letter from Brown in this morning's mail. It was a suicide note. Oh. Well, what are you beefing about? Ain't that how you wanted it to look? Yes. I'll be up to your office in half an hour for my dough. Don't waste your time. Look, that money is coming to me. I'm going to get it. You're not getting a dime. Mr. Stevens, I wouldn't talk like that if I was you. You made a deal. My part is finished. You're finished too, Marshal. Goodbye. I kept you waiting, Norm. That's okay, Jim. Traffic's pretty heavy. I just got down myself. How'd you make out? I didn't. I just missed Stephen. That was his officer. Yeah? And from all I gathered, it's another of his blue sky propositions. I found that much out while you were gone. Huh? We got a phone call from a Mr. Pine. Who's he? One of the men who invested his money with Stevens. How come he called the office? Well, he said he got a letter in this morning's mail from a man named Victor Brown. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. He said he was going to commit suicide, but before he did, he wanted to tell him some things. Uh, who was Brown? He was Stevens' bookkeeper. Oh. According to Pine's story, Brown was out of work for some time before he got the job with Stevens, and he was so grateful to him that he got all of his friends to invest their money. Tell me, did uh, Brown commit suicide? Yes, I checked. He killed himself last night in his apartment. Oh. What else he tell this Mr. Pine in the letter? That he had discovered that Stevens was stealing the funds of the company and trying to pin it on him. I see, and then decided he couldn't face them when he found out what was going on. That's right. Poor guy. Did you find anything at all at Stevens' office, Jim? Nothing much. Some charred papers in a wastebasket. Stevens had been in this morning, all right. I guess he burned everything that might have proved damaging to him. Where does he live? We might catch him at home. No one in the office knows where he lives. He seemed to be very careful to keep that a secret, Norm. Yeah, it's obvious why. Yeah, it is now. Where are we headed for, Jim? The bank where the Broadlawn Television Network Company has an account. Let's hope they know where Stevens lives. What have you got there, Jim? These are all the canceled checks from the Broadlawn Television Network Company's account. Oh, good. Here, yeah, Mr. Hubbard said we could use this desk here. Okay. Sit over there. Right. Well, except for the salary checks for the people up at the office, Stevens doesn't seem to have drawn checks to anyone but himself. That sounds like him. Mm. Oh, Stevens also keeps his personal account here. Are we going to get the canceled checks on that account, too? Yeah. Mr. Hubbard said he'd bring them over as soon as his girl got them out of the files. Uh, Mr. Hubbard didn't have a home address on Stevens, did he, Jim? No. No, both the business and the personal accounts gave only his office address. Here's Stevens' personal checks. I'm sorry we were so long in getting them. Oh, it's all right. Thanks very much, Mr. Hubbard. I hope they'll be of some help to you. We do, too. You'll be able to keep the name of the bank out of all this, won't you? I'm sure we will, sir. Thank you very much. Not at all. Hey, Norm, this is more like it. Why didn't we get these first? Come on, let's get to a phone. Who's there? Telegram, Mr. Stevens. Step back, Stevens. Get your hands up. I told you you'd fall for that old gag, honey. What are you doing here? What do you think? Who told you where I lived? Nobody. I'll tell you last night after you left your office. You didn't think I trusted you, did you? This isn't going to help you. It ain't going to hurt me, none either. Give me my money, you phony chiseler. Ted, look over there. He's all packed and ready to leave. Yeah. Come on, Stevens, up with the door. Where is it? That's my business. But I got the gun. I'll give you 30 seconds to come up with that money, Stevens. If you don't, this gun goes off. Drop that uh, gun. Uh, Pick up his gun, Norm. Right. I'm, I'm certainly glad you men got here when you did. 
These people forced their way in here. They were just holding me up. I'll save that for the jury, Stevens. We're special agents of the FBI. So what? Yes, you're the one we came here to get. Catching these two is just velvet. All right, Norm, let's take them all downtown. Walter Stevens was tried, convicted, and executed for the murder on the government reservation of Paul Dodge, his first bookkeeper. Ted Marshall was found to have been previously wanted for murder. He, too, was prosecuted, convicted, and executed on this charge. His wife, June, was given a life sentence for conspiracy to commit murder. The solution to tonight's case was brought about by the bank investigation. In going over canceled checks, one of the checks in Stevens' personal account was found to be made out to the Winona Taylor shop. A phone call to the shop revealed Stevens' home address. And thus armed, your FBI was able to close the careers of these criminals. Sometimes, as in tonight's case, a criminal will seemingly escape unpunished after having committed as grave a crime as murder. But as the records show, he never really escapes. It may take a month or a year or 15 years to catch him, but ultimately the clock runs out for every criminal because your FBI is not an organization with a short memory. However long it takes, no file is ever forgotten or put away until there is a rubber stamp affixed to the first page. A rubber stamp which spells out one word. The word, convicted. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's case from the files of your FBI. Now three final questions on the Equitable Society's independent 60s plan. Mr. Keating, suppose I start a plan now, and then my income goes up in the next few years. Can I increase the amount of my independent 60s plan? An excellent idea. Your Equitable Society representative will be glad to lay out a plan like that for you. Well, what about my Social Security? Is that a factor to consider? It certainly is. Your Equitable Society representative will show you how to make it dovetail with your independent 60s plan. Oh, what income will, I, uh, will it give me in my 60s? Your Equitable Society representative will give you the exact figure. Either get in touch with him soon or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A case that involves the bold operations of a receiver of stolen goods. Its subject, hijacking. Its title, the three-way frame-up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The three-way frame-up on This Is Your FBI. The preceding program came to you by transcription.